Jesus, the rock. Let's come to him this morning. Our Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be able to come and just to be able to worship you. Many countries around the world don't have that freedom. Many people around the world don't have the freedom to be able to do that. But Father, we can here and we're so grateful for that. And we recognize, Lord, that uh, we come here completely of our own volition, our own, own will. We're not forced to be here, Father. We're here because we long to be here today. And we believe, Father, that you have something you want to say to us. We look around the world and we see, Father, there's so many things that are falling apart, so many things that are tragic in our world. There are wars, there are rumours of wars, there is, there is uh, tragedy in uh, all kinds of places. There are people living in poverty, people struggling with health issues, families that are devastated by the loss of a loved one, families, Father, that would love to be an extended family. We recognize this world is broken. It has been damaged because of our sinfulness and our brokenness ourselves. Well, we long for the day when one day you will come back and you'll take us home and there'll be a new heaven, there'll be a new earth, there'll be an opportunity for us to be able to come into your presence and there will be no more pain, no more heartache, no more tears, no more crying, no more death, no more separation. So, Father God, we come to you this morning, just trusting in you. We bring the needs of those around us to you. For those, Father, that are our loved ones that maybe are battling at the moment, those names that maybe nobody else knows, but we lift them up before you right now, at this moment, so that, God, you would touch their life, bring healing where that's necessary, bring comfort where that is necessary, and help them, Father, to know the love of God. I want to again, Lord, pray for our young families in our church this morning. The role of parents, Lord, is becoming increasingly difficult and we ask that you would give wisdom and strength to those, Lord, that are seeking to raise up children. We ask, Lord, that they might honour you in the way that they do that. That there might be, Father, a strength beyond themselves as we seek to lead our children into a life that knows you and honours you. Father, as we open your word this morning, I want to pray that you would teach us. Help us, Father, to hear the things that we need to hear specifically this morning. Those things, Father, that maybe we hadn't heard anywhere else, Lord, we need to hear today. I don't believe, Father, you bring us here by accident. We are here, Lord, because you have drawn us here. and You have something you want to say to us. So may my words today be your words that speak into the hearts of people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to take you to um, the scriptures this morning. We're going to be looking in Luke 18 in just a moment. But you know, the dedication of a baby is a very significant event. And uh, today, Jared and Shani have uh, brought their children uh, here and they've made some commitments to providing an environment where they have an opportunity to, to come up to know Christ and to, to respond to him. We've already talked about the fact that Jesus has a very special place uh, for uh, children. I wonder if we can throw that up on the screen. Thank you, Margaret. And uh, in fact, he rebuked those who stopped them from coming to them, who stopped them from coming and when you think about how the disciples reacted with this, and we're going to read this passage in a moment, it's perfectly understandable because we do the same with our children. Sometimes we're having adult conversations and the children come along. Uh, my children are adults now, but when they were little, and they come along and uh, there are conversations that adults might have that really don't have anything to do with the children. And so we kind of shield them from that or we, we kind of push them away a little bit sometimes. They couldn't possibly understand what was being said or they have no part in that conversation. And so I wonder whether that's the kind of thinking that the disciples had when the parents were bringing the little children to Jesus. And they were thinking, this is for adults. Jesus has come for adults. He hasn't come for children. And so he's kind of pushing the children, or they're pushing the children away and stopping them from coming to Jesus. 
I wonder whether they had decided in their own mind that Jesus was just for them. And these little children could have no comprehension, no understanding. They couldn't do it. So let's take a look at this story. In Luke chapter 18, verse 15 to 17, it's just three verses. All right, we read this. One day, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. In verse 17, I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Have a look at that last verse on the screen. Anyone who does not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Sometimes in our role as adults, we've restricted the gospel to just people who have knowledge and understanding, uh, allowing it for people to, once they get old enough to understand, then the gospel is okay for them. And I've heard parents say to me, well, you know what, I'm going to let my little kids, they're going to decide for themselves when they get older. Ever heard that? Isn't it interesting? It's probably the only thing we actually let our children decide when they get older. We don't do it for anything else. Can you imagine saying to this to your children, well, actually, I'm not going to feed them. I'm just going to let them decide what they're going to eat. When they're old enough and they'll eat when they, they want to, they can eat whatever they want to do. Wouldn't that be a great way of raising your kids? Or what if um, you said to your children, you know, uh, look, you don't have to go to school. You can decide if you want to go to school or not. Wouldn't that have been great? Teachers are all saying, yeah. <laughs> if, if we just let the kids decide when they want to go to school and if they don't want to go to school, that's okay. You just stay in bed all day or play on the PlayStation. You have play PlayStations these days? Showing my age. Or what about, do you know what? When you get older, you can decide if you want to leave home or not. <laughs> Some of you are already thinking, no, uh, that's not happening. I'll just wait till they have, they can decide that. If they want to stay, they can stay and they can make up their own mind about that. Uh, but just let me know once you've decided. Or you can come home at any time you like. You know, when you think it's right to come home after a night out, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can decide. You see, we don't do it for any other thing. But I hear parents say to me, well, I'll let my children decide about religion. I'll let my children decide those things when they get older and, and we don't put any input into their life. And if you think about the absurdity of that, surely you want to give your children something that is wholesome, something that is holy, something that is, that is good for them and you want to give them a foundation for that. It doesn't force them to believe anything it doesn't force them to make a decision but at least it provides the environment for them the foundation for them every person has to decide what they do with christ every person has to decide what they do with jesus every person has to make those decisions themselves but surely we as parents ought to provide the kind of environment where they're likely to make a choice that is going to be wholesome for them and godly for them. You know, I've done a lot of funerals over the last 30 years, so probably average a couple of months at the moment. I did one this week, and I shared with a lady, I didn't share with her, she was 90 years old, she died. And, uh, but I was sharing at the, the funeral in Meribra this week, and a godly woman, and we talked about the fact that life is so short that eternity is forever surely when I raise my children I want to help them to focus on something that is going to last forever rather than just the temporary of this life life is short eternity is forever we have not exposed our children to Christianity when we're, run, when we're young but we're quite happy for them to be exposed to every other belief that undermines Christianity. You can think about some of those. 
By the time they're 12 or 13 years of age, they've been exposed to everything else in the name of letting them choose for themselves, not realising that the early years are the formative years for shaping their values. No wonder the ancient writer of Proverbs said this, and I read it in the dedication service, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's not a guarantee that. In fact, the, if you look at the original writings of that, it actually says that uh, train up a child in, his, in the way he should go, and when he is old, it will not depart from him, is the way that it's written. It will stay with them. It will be there with them. So here's why it's important that we make these commitments to our children as Jared and Shani have done today, here's why the gospel message is not only appropriate for children, but essential for children to be exposed to early. Here's the first one, and it's this. Margaret, can we just flick on that for me, please? All right, children can understand the gospel because the message of the gospel is simple. It's simple. Now, let me say this, religion is complex, okay, Religion is complex, Christianity is simple. Religion is, here's a set of rules and I've got to keep all these rules to please this higher being of some kind. So, and sometimes we kind of translate that into Christianity. We say Christianity is a religion and so, you know, if I'm going to be a Christian, I've got to stop swearing, smoking, cursing, you know, I can't go to parties, I've got to dress a certain way, I've got to go to church every Sunday, I've got to pray, I've got to read my Bible, I've got to do all these things. I want to say to you, that's what makes Christianity a religion, not a relationship. Christianity is a relationship. Oh yes, there are some things we want to do, but we do it out of love because of the relationship, not because there's a list of rules that if I tick them off, I please this higher being in some way. Religion is complex. It's tough. You might have to pray three times a day. You might have to you know, not go to certain places or you have to change your schedule to do all of those kinds of things. But Christianity is simple. It's simple. We walked away from a relationship with God thinking that we knew better. We lived a, a life of self-centeredness and, and sin. That's what our problem was. And God pursued us, he pursued us because he loved us and he wanted a relationship with us. So he provided a means for us to come back into the relationship with him and he gave us the gift of Jesus, his son, and he says, here's the gift, all you have to do is receive it. Christianity is simple. And you'll notice in, in that, here we go, get the right one. You'll notice in that there's nothing about not swearing, not drinking, not smoking, not cursing, not, you know, it's nothing there about going to church. It's simply about receiving a relationship gift. All because God loves us. Religion, it's hard work. Christianity is simple because it's a relationship. Now, we'll follow through on that just a little bit more. But it's not about keeping rules. And I want to say to you this morning, even Koa and Henley understand what a relationship is. Even they understand what a relationship is. Don't think the gospel is only for those who have, you know, are 12 or 13 years of age or older. The gospel is for little children who can understand the concept of relationship. You know, one of the things I, I love more than anything else is I look at um, every Sunday afternoon, generally, we get a video call from my son and, and daughter-in-law and my grandson and now my granddaughter. Um, she hasn't video called me yet. But, um, but when we come on the screen and I see my grandson and he recognizes me and he goes, Granddad! And there's something inside of me, even though we're separated by such a distance... But it's the relationship, it's the recognition of the relationship. Christianity is a relationship with God, not a list of rules that I've got to keep. 
The second thing I want to share with you this morning is this, that children need to hear the gospel and know about Jesus because it's the only message of hope, of true hope that they're ever going to hear. Children will be bombarded through their life with things that promise hope but only result in destruction and pain. And a look around the world shows a picture of hopelessness. I don't want to be too negative here, but every parent wants what's best for their children, am I right? Of course they do. And every parent wants their child to invest their life in things that give them hope for a future and hope for a better life and and a hope of getting ahead. And the world tells you the way you do that is you get a good education, you get a good job, you get a lot of money, you get a house and you get a car and you get possessions and you get all of those kinds of things and you keep fit and you eat the right food and you do all of those things and you'll have a good future. (laughs) How many of us have realized over the years, us older folk, okay, that sometimes those things that we've invested our life in really don't matter you can lose them like that some of you have lost your fitness some of us realize that our health can change just like that yeah my dad tells me every now and I can't do the things I used to be able to do well dad you're 85 (laughs) he's looking for more lawns to mow if anyone would like to Uh, it's all right (laughs) The body doesn't work. Our health can deteriorate just like that. And if you invest your hope in those things which aren't going to last, well, what sort of life is that? Surely we ought to be investing our life in those things that are going to last forever. Surely we want our children to grow up. Do you know... Everything that the world offers one day will fail us. Our health will fail. Our good looks will disappear for some of you. And uh, (laughs) Oh, I'm going to be in trouble today. What hope do you have then? Because nothing that this world offers actually has value of hope. The most hopeful people alive are not those who depend on what the world can give. The most hopeful people alive are those who've invested in eternity for a relationship with Christ. And I'm not talking about a wishful thinking kind of hope. I'm talking about a certainty, an assurance, a calmness, a sense of peace, that that an assurance that we know it's true. We know it's true. Therefore, our children need to hear the message of the gospel. I can almost guarantee that there's not a parent alive here today who has as their ultimate dream for their child that they be rich or they be good looking or they live in a big house or they drive an expensive vehicle. There's not a parent here today whose ultimate dream for their children is that that's what they'll have. When I talk to parents often, their dream for their children generally fits into two categories. One is they want them to be healthy and happy. And secondly, that they'll find fulfillment and satisfaction in in the job that they have. And and many parents say, you know, I don't mind what my children do as long as they're comfortable, as long as they're happy, as long as they've got the things that they need, you know, to, to actually live that kind of life. It's not about the things that the world offers. The only way that that can really happen is if their hope is something other than what the world offers. And the hope for what the world offers pales into insignificance with the hope of what Christ offers. The gospel, the message about Jesus brings hope. Jesus said this in John 14, 27. He said, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Again in Mark 8, 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet to forfeit his soul? And I want to say that's the message we need to be teaching our young people. Get our values out of this world and our values into another world. Because that's what's going to last. See, life is short, but eternity is forever. There's a third truth in this passage. 
So unless we as adults receive this message like children, we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 17, I tell you the truth, anyone who enters, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Matthew's gospel puts it this way, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Normally we would think that should be the other way around. Children should become like their parents. Children should become like adults. But not here. <laughs> if you want to enter into the kingdom of heaven, you've got to become like a little child. In fact, um, the kingdom of God is different. It's an upside down kind of kingdom. Now, those who've been a part of this church over the years would have heard me talk about this before. But, you know, the kingdom of God is upside down. It doesn't make that kind of sense. Jesus said, if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you've got to become the least of all. If you want to lead, you must become a servant of everyone. The first will be last. And now, unless you become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. It's an upside down kind of kingdom. The values and the perspectives of this world are in opposition to the values and perspective of the kingdom of God. And by the way, let me just outline a couple of things that Jesus means by this. Firstly, He's not saying that you need, if you're an adult, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. There are many people in their adult life who've understood the truth of the gospel and made a decision to follow Christ. He's not saying that you have to be immature to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, he's not saying you have to act like a little child. Okay? So stop it. <laughs> There's much more than this. Yeah, one of the things that struck me this week, we have, we have this little granddaughter who is just a week old and she is the tiniest little thing. I mean, she, I know Noah was that small as well, but, but she is just so tiny and she's helpless. <laughs> she can't do anything. Why bother? No. <laughs> <laughs> She is totally dependent upon her parents and the other adults around her. She's totally dependent upon them for food, for bathing, for changing their nappy. They're totally dependent for movement. She is absolutely, totally dependent upon the adults around her. When Jesus says, unless you become like a little child, I think what he's saying is this, that unless you recognize your total dependence upon the one who is greater, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you recognize that you are totally at the mercy of God, there is nothing you can do without the power from God. That's what it means to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Author Kent, uh, Kent Hughes said this, if Billy Graham enters the kingdom, it will not be because he's personally preached to more people than any man in history. It will not be because he remained impeccable in his finances. This is before he died, by the way. Uh, so many have failed. It will not be because he is a faithful husband. It will not be because he, despite his fame, he remained a humble, self-effacing, kind man. When Billy Graham enters the kingdom, it will be because he came to Christ as a helpless, ch helpless child. It was because of God's undeserved kindness towards Billy's helplessness. Totally dependent. Absolutely helpless. So what Jesus does is he reconnects reception in the kingdom of God with the child's attitude humility recognizing you can't get there on your own and as we wrap up let me just share with you very briefly four characteristics of children that I think we need to adopt the first is this unmitigated trust children trust their parents for everything their food their lodging their safety the arms of those who will take care of them Those who receive 
the kingdom like a little child have that saving element of faith, that complete trust in God, unmitigated trust. Secondly, untutored humility. Children don't engage in the various forms of pride that we as adults do. You know, we kind of grow into that. There's not much pride in, I mean, there's a bit of arrogance and stuff in little children, of course, but, but the pride in, in these little kids. When I looked at our little granddaughter, no pride there. No pride. Humility. Untutored humility. A child doesn't battle self-righteousness in coming to Christ. Uh, Self-righteousness is impossible in a child. And children are teachable too, by the way. They receive the gospel without proposing amendments to it. They don't hold Jesus seminars. Okay? They just accept it. Thirdly, there's untarnished receptivity. Children love receiving gifts. You ever notice that? generally love the wrapping more than the gift but that's okay at their first birthday they're not sure what a gift is as two-year-olds if they have siblings they understand well enough and by the way when they're three they're really into receptivity (laughs) the wrapping paper starts to fly and fourthly unabashed love children easily return love for loving gifts enthusiastic hugs and kisses and multiple thanks are showered on the giver unabashed love is the province of those who receive the kingdom as a little child so there you have it today jared and shani dedicated koa and henley to the lord and we remember we need to remember that unless we receive the kingdom of god like a little child we can never enter into it That's the lesson for us as adults this morning. That's the lesson for us and Henley to learn from the little children. As they teach us what it is to trust unconditionally. They teach us what it is to trust without pride. Charles Spurgeon once said, we must not think a child cannot come to God unless he is like a man, but a man cannot come until he is like a child. We must grow down until we become like a child. Friends, my prayer for you this morning, we reflect on Koa and Henley and the family and the dedication that we've had today, that we would receive the gift of life like a little child, to respond to him. It's a wonderful gift. It's the only message that offers hope. It's the simple message of salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Our Father, we're grateful this morning that we can come and we can serve you and open our hearts to you. And we do thank you for little children. We thank you, Father, for these two that we've dedicated. But we thank you, Father, that unless we become like little children, we can never come into relationship with you. Forgive us for treating Christianity like a religion. Forgive us for for portraying that to others and help us to live in relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.